Hello, and welcome to another installment of At The Podium with me, Patrick Huey. At The Podium is a platform where we will learn from people who come from different walks of life, careers, and experiences, but all share one thing in common. They have stepped fully into the transformative power of saying yes to the unexpected turns of their lives, and they are now using the power of their voice or podium to make an impact on the world we live in today. At the podium is the intersection of art, culture, and big thoughts wrapped up in good old fashioned conversation. Today, I'm thrilled and humbled to share the podium with Katherine Hahn. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Hi, Catherine. Honey. Hi, honey. Hello, how hello. Are, how are I, you? I am very well. It feels so good to be finally in fall, to have some sort of weather in Los Angeles. I love it. It's been a hot summer. It was. Know. It really was. So, Catherine, <laughs> I am so glad that you're here at the podium with me. And I was actually talking to a friend of mine whom who you, you, you don't know her. She's an actress. But she was like, I really want to have Catherine Hahn's career because she does everything. She does oh everything. Goodness. And I was like, I'm like, how am I going to start this conversation with Catherine? Because we know each other so well. And I was like, that's the perfect way in. Because you're in an industry that is by nature designed to keep people in very specific categories. But you have really built your career as a chameleon. You do film, you do theater, you do major motion pictures, you do independent films. Te television series, you're a producer, Marvel Universe character. And then beneath all of those different genres, you've played this really wide range of roles. So how have you managed to build that career? I know it's really, it is really when I step back and look at it, I, you know, at first we would say like my, you know, I've had my one and only agent for my whole, my whole career from way back when. And we, you know, start laughing sometimes because there really is, it feels so chaotic. Like it just feels like whatever the next thing has been just is, has been the next thing. Um, and, but when you look back at it, it's, it, it we, we I really feel so blessed that I haven't been pigeonholed. And it is a weird thing to be like, how did we pull that off? And I think a lot of it is that it just has like, frankly, just been under the radar for so long that nobody cared. Like I was able to walk into a room as a general unknown for decades and so I was, I was able to kind of be like who can, you know this is I've never seen this person before we can hire her this way or I've never seen this person before we can hire her this way and also I think it was because you know I was thinking about the theme of your beautiful podcast and that moment of pivot and for me that moment of pivot was when I was living in New York City and I had gone I was you know I had had a mountain of debt from undergrad I was working at a hair salon. You wouldn't know it now. I was just, I was a receptionist. So we'll give, we'll give her that. She never had to handle a brush. <laughs> they never gave her a brush. But, and I was like, I was, you know, waiting for the backstage. I was, you know, was not working as an actor at all. And I got into Yale and I was like, it was, I remember some director of this off, 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 off Broadway sh theater company that was, that I was involved in. It was one of those theater companies that you had to like, all of a sudden I was like sanding his floors and I was like, what is happening? And I had to like, you know what I mean? It was like sh real shady. And I had to like, it was one of those theater companies you had to like sell a certain amount of tickets in order to be in the play. And I remember him saying, you're going to lose your ingenue years. And I was like, huh, because I never saw myself as the ingenue. Those were not the parts that were the most compelling to me. Those were always the parts that were written for me by the dude looking at the woman that was the part that was not as compelling. They were never seen from the inside of the, theme, of the experience that I would have had as, a, as a, a woman looking from the inside. And I didn't care if I missed out on those anyway. I was never going to be cast that way. And so Yale to me was never about getting to the next step career wise. It was just about being able to act. And, and if I had to take out more debt to do it, then, you know, screw it. And so that experience and meeting you and meeting like was, I will hold to my heart forever as the most sacred three year, three years, maybe it was a year too long. Who am I to say? But I think that it was for me, the experience that pivot for me 
was, I think, helped in the rest of my whatever this, let's call it a career, but, you know, whatever this messy, whatever this unable to be pigeonholed chapter has been, because I was able when I was there to play grandma, to play whatever, to play. And it really opened my, uh, I didn't see myself as just under the gaze of some, you know, you know, I guess Anglo idea of beauty. So I was able to play whatever. And I was able to take that out into the, ne you know, the next phase of my career. I, I think what's interesting about what you said too, is that here you are quite, I mean, you walked out of Yale and had some great success out of that between crossing Jordan and how to lose a guy. Mm -hmm. You walked out with some really great opportunities. And yet you felt in your career, you were flying under the radar, which mm -hmm. allowed you, which Vanity Fair picked up on that in a review of Mrs. Fletcher, that you are very much, you fly under the radar, which you would think people in the industry don't want to have that flying under the radar. They want the exposure, they want the, the accolades, but you actually use that to your advantage. Yeah, I mean, listen, I've been called like, you know, you know, the um, underestimate, like I have been called those, those phrases so many times, the like, you know, underappreciated, underestimated, like that's kind of goes along. And I, now I'm like, just to be, even have those, any words attached is like, I don't care. I, you know, it means, uh, for me, it means, uh, um, a little bit more flexibility or a little bit more surprise you know it means that people are like oh right that person rather than maybe um being seen as just one thing you know my friend and I were laughing so hard they were like it seems like a there was a joke that she was going to make for something about how when a woman gets to a certain age she gets the horny parts and then she gets the witch, the witch parts. And I'm like, oh my God, I've played them both, I guess. Like, what's next? Like, I don't know. <laughs> that there's like certain, that there's certain stages in a woman's career in Hollywood that I, that I feel like I'm checking off the box, the boxes is like, but the fact that I'm able to like, even be checking off, you know, to be able to be like flipping around in the genres is, is really, is, I mean, you know, I didn't think, I still am that receptionist in my mind. Like I still, I mean, they would be horrified if they saw my hair. I still am very, very close. Like I think we all are to that young person that it just goes so fast. That is so still hungry for something. That's why I think this podcast is so beautiful and so genius because it's like, at what point can we finally put down the gauntlet and say, like, life is so beautiful. Like, we are so lucky. Like, we are, look what we made. And, like, it doesn't look anything like I thought it was going to look like. In fact, it's more amazing. Like, you know, it's so, it, and it still is not, no matter what, who you are it still doesn't feel exactly what you thought it was going to be. It never does. You never reach that point where you go, okay, this is it. It never. never. There's always going to be like, ah, that director, or that director, and I wish I was in that scene or like, you know, that in those, like that, you know, amazing group of performers that gets to work with those people and that thing over there. Like, but so at what point are you like, ah, you know, I don't know if you ever reach that point where you're just you, like, you can't. You can't. That's that's the life. That's the living. Yeah. Okay. So you said horny lady, which we're going to talk about. I watched Mrs. Fletcher mm -hmm. and I wept through, I think, every episode because oh. it was just, there was something about that particular character that I think resonated with a lot of people yeah. who have kids who've left to go to school, who've had marriages that fall apart, who are literally in a dead end career. And they're like, what's left? And what's left is the journey of Mrs. Fletcher. And I love, I just, I loved that not only did you star in that, that you produce that. Hmm. So you, 
I mean, the work was so nuanced and complicated. And, I, and as I watched it, I kept saying, is America ready for, ready for this kind of show, for this kind of story? Mm. Um, when you were doing it, what, what do you think the draw was for Eve, the character you played towards pornography? Like, what did that represent for her? Mrs. Fletcher was based on a um, Tom Parada novel who uh, his work is like so adaptable. He did um, Little Children and Election and The Leftovers. So his work is like incredibly adaptable. This is the first time that he was um, involved as like a showrunner. So that was really interesting for him, like a big learning curve for him as well, because like, you know, he usually would like hand it over to somebody else, like Alexander Payne or Todd Haynes or um, Damon Lindelof. So this was the first time that he was like really, really involved. And it was a big learning curve for him, um, especially because it's about the interior life of a woman's, you know, sexual longings and life. Uh, you know, hats off to him, you know, for being like, this is you know, it was very important to me that it'd be all women directors because of that. We got a great group of women and amazing humans. And, you know, I think for Eve, to me, it was very interesting because my mom is in the same situation. She and my father have been divorced forever and she still holds his last name. Eve has been divorced from her husband for so long and she's still Mrs. Fletcher. And so it's like this identity that had been hers for so long and she's still kind of holding on to it. It doesn't really even belong. It's like this archaic um, shell that she's still kind of holding on to. It doesn't even really belong to her, but like it's easier to hold on to than go through all the motions of letting that go in, in, all, in all levels. And, um, uh, you know, I think that that world, that like illicit world of like this forbidden Pandora's box of porn it's not really even about porn it's about just like what she didn't think she could be uh what she wasn't allowing herself to see beyond past motherhood or past you know wifehood or whatever that it just became it just became something that was like just hers and just private and just like a life that could just be that just could be hers so it wasn't about you know the porn it was just about like her interior liberation that just then became you know, she took baby steps into the outside, into the outside with it. It allowed her like some, some freedom. I feel like all the characters in that movie, I mean, we really follow you and your son in the movie. Yeah. But I think all of those characters, you know, the, the trans female who's trying to find love. I love know. her, Jen Richards, who's so oh. incredible. And she's such a beautiful performer. And that love uh, story between her and uh, that man who you did, like, are, they're just so beautiful together. And yeah, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And like, you're, like you're right, nuanced and romantic. And it's not about her transness. And like, it's like, it's just, be it's beautifully, beautifully, um, delicately, uh, beautifully normalized. I, lo I loved it so much. I really found myself rooting for these characters yeah. and they're all quite flawed. I mean, the, the yeah. they're all quite flawed. None of them are sort of those textbook archetypes that we think about in terms of character in, in, in film, particularly in television, but you, yeah. you end up rooting for the characters, which I think is the brilliance of the work that you were able to, to produce and to be a part of. Well, you know, and talk about this beautiful podcast you're doing, like, you know, when you, 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 when you say that I produced it, you know, I wasn't a producer at the beginning and it was as the work was going on and as the thing, as we were making it and the more and more I was putting myself forward to ask for things and to um, put my, you know, the more, the more involved and more collaborative it became, the more clear it was to me that I was not just wearing an actor hat on this, that I was not just showing up as an actor. And then I, at a certain point, I was like, I'm a producer on this. And to HBO and everybody's and Tom and everybody else's credit, they were like, you are. So I, that was a real pivot. I like asked, I asked for what I was. I mean, I, I just simply was a producer. I, what I was, did not set, up, set out as one. I, I, it was something I had to ask for. And that was a huge step for me, Patrick. Like I, that was huge, but it was very, I also did that on I Love Dick. That was it, but with Joey Soloway, who did yes. Transparent and Afternoon Delight, a, a frequent collaborator. And um, they, it was a similar situation where it was like only like mid to midway through 
almost halfway through that I, that was, you know, Kevin was a producer on at Bacon. And of course, like he, he, you know, has been a producer on many, many things, but I was like, wait, the, the it doesn't make sense that the I and I love Dick is a producer. I mean, that the, the Dick and I love Dick is a producer and the I is not like, this is not okay. And everyone was like, you're right, you're right. So the, to everybody's credit that they, they made it happen, but it just goes to show you that that's the only way that change can happen is if the person speaks up and out talk about pivoting like you just it's like a that vulnerable first step off the cliff into asking for what is clearly the truth and what clearly is the what's necessary is terrifying i love that because so many times i know in my own life in my own career trajectory it's sometimes really hard Horrible. even for the men to walk That's into I mean, sure. you, you can go to auto and say well i want to pay anybody it's hard hard it's so hard and this like this didn't even like this wasn't even affecting pay grade this was just like a thing on this was just like a cre you know a credit but i was like it would it just i was like this is I've, I've clearly done more than i'm not just i'm not just an actor on this and i want to be recognized as such like i knew that it was and everybody had it was like everyone was like oh of course but it just took me to just point it out for everybody to be like you're right that first step is so hard because you're basically could be like considered as calling somebody out for not seeing it in the first place. But if, if it's done with love, it's like, as I, as I did, I love all these people. It was like, it was met with like, of course, you know what I mean? Like if, if it's done with like the, in the right energy and no defensiveness and no, like, it's just, it was just not seen. I didn't see it until that moment. That's amazing. Okay. So I, I love Mrs. Fletcher. Hmm. But we're going to have to talk about Miss Thing, Agnes. Ooh, I love her. Ooh. I love her so. And Agatha. And Agatha. Okay, first of all, mm -hmm. you, that show, WandaVision, captured the imagination of the country. I mean, at one point, your song was the number one download on iTunes, which oh, literally, crazy. I was like, this is pretty amazing. I tapped Justin Bieber, apparently. Someone told me that, and I was like, if you say so, but that does not make sense. But, but let me tell you, I have a friend of mine who has a little boy. We call him Little Michael. He literally cannot stop talking about the show, your performance, because it resonated something within him and his friends in such a really profound way. What was that, do you think? I was not a hugely read in all things Marvel before I came on board. So I didn't really know all the lingo and all the Easter eggs or what they call them. And I, I didn't really know everything about Marvel. So my kids kind of had to walk me through it all because I didn't really know anything. Like I was like, I don't know what's going on. And, and what I did when I, when they told me that I was going to be playing a centuries old witch, I was like, yes. And when they told me it was going to be going through all these different, like basically sitcoms that she had buried, this character had buried her childhood and her adulthood trauma through these sitcoms that she had, that she had, that was the only way through the outside world when she was in this kind of like fictionalized Eastern European country, like as a child, that that was how she, I was like, oh, but that sounds fabulous. And I was going to be kind of buried in as this neighbor trope throughout all these. I thought, oh, well, that's going to be so much fun. And I knew the costumes were going to be fabulous. And I knew that, the, you know, there's going to be great wigs and jokes and whatever. And I, I knew the first one was going to be filmed in front of a live audience. And all of that sounded fabulous. And that our director came from the theater. What I didn't expect, I think that it was going to be such a deep dive that it was going to feel that it was going to feel actually so deep and the, that the first episode that was filmed in front of a live audience really made us feel like a theater troupe going forward so that it really did feel like in the middle of all of this like giant Marvel production, it felt so small and I love those actors so much. And I think there was something fun for maybe for kids and maybe I'm projecting this or assuming this, but I mean, my kids are a little older, but I think there was something fun about this villain. She kind of lives in that gray area of that is like my favorite that she's not 
she's funny too. Like she's not just the bad guy. Like she's, she's like wants to mentor Wanda. Like you think you're not exactly sure. She's not so scary. So maybe that's exactly, maybe that's why a kid responds. And like, I think her reveal was just so delicious. Just like felt like it was just fun. I think the part where she's revealed, you've so been on a ride with these characters through these different sitcom genres. And then when when she mm-hmm. breaks through the, the barrier into the world, you're like, what's happening? And then when the reveal happens, it literally, <laughs> it pulls it all together. Yeah. I don't and know then, how you filmed that though. How did you film? We, we would just, at the, at the end of every decade that we shot, we would be like, okay, the, you know, the Agatha theme. And, and when it was really like, everyone had to be, it was like NDA city. Like it, we were so quiet. Everybody was like, so hush hush. So I don't even think it was called that. It was just called the reveal. And then we would just take like a half an hour and I would just do like, you know, I, I would just hand bone it up right to camera. I would just be like, you know, whatever. Like I would just do a little something right down the barrel in, in my costume. And then they would save that for the reveal but so we would at the end of every decade they would just dedicate like you know whatever half an hour 45 minutes and then um and then they cut it all together and then I spent like a half an hour in a recording studio which was you know um with the on zoom with the freaking Lopez's who wrote freaking Frozen um who did all of our jingles you know all of the theme songs and they had me just sing the thing and that was also crazy and so fun and the first time I heard it I was like oh my god it's like the monsters I was so excited and but I you know none of us had any idea it was going to be like that like land like that I mean that was hilarious like no one had any idea so um and we just basically like they had me you know had me sing it in different karaoke genres and we landed on it was somewhere in a Pat Benatar you know whatever area but I mean it was so fun it was so fun. you know it's it is in that mushy fun gray area of like you know she wants to mentor Wanda like she wants to befriend her she's so jealous of her she's like doesn't understand her she wants to mother her she wants to like you know it's all the fun stuff it's not just like you know it's my favorite kind of you know my favorite kind of villain I guess I loved that last episode where the two of you just go toe to toe to toe yeah and you're fighting it out in the in the fiery sky it was just it was breathtaking I can't believe I got ever got to do something like that it was so crazy Patrick <laughs> like I couldn't believe it like there are times where I was, I was like up on those wires looking at her we would just start giggling like I was like I know you're used to this this is a brand new world to me and I, I, it was breathtaking to look at her up on those wires and just to be in, in the middle of, it was like, the, the, it was really like a very moving. The whole, the whole show itself was quite moving. I mean, that yeah. ending, she has to make that choice. I mean, you know, that you know where we're going when she makes that choice. And it literally, it I moved know. Me. Well, it's like such a metaphor. Like I remember crying at the, one of the first table reads because I was like, this is such a metaphor for I mean, it was like such a mini metaphor for a, the pandemic. It was just like the feeling like the having to stay isolated or staying like, you know, keeping your family safe while you feel like the, the threat coming closer and closer. It just felt like such a weird, um, you know, cause we were shooting it at least the, out of the finale. And also it was such a metaphor for just the filmmaking of pro- the process of making a movie, because it was like, you can feel the end getting closer and closer and like, and making of a movie is such a film. It's such a bubble. Like you're in such a short period of time with like such a, you become so close with this group of people. And then all of a sudden everybody just goes off and does things with everybody else. And you sometimes see people again, sometimes don't, you know what I mean? It's like, like school, like whatever, like it's like an ensemble, like you just, or, you know, a group, a conference or whatever you like, you get close with people for a short time. And then you just see, you know, you see it, the hex coming closer and closer and you're like, oh no, like, you know, or life, like whatever. It's just, it's such a metaphor for all of it. So it was real, um, I just, or parenthood, like you have your kids for such a short amount of time before they, um, they're out the door. So it was like a real, a real metaphor. Catherine, you have really cornered this market on comedy. And I use that term very loosely because I think the work is much deeper, but how do you, what is comedy for you? How do you define that? And how, how do you approach the work? 
I haven't done like a, you know, bad, bad moms. I feel like it was maybe the last one I did. And that was a while ago. I don't know. I approach it like we would have at school. Like it's it all comes from the same source. Like it has to be from the same place. You have to know it's just all from the script. And like, I think script always just tells you what the tone is exactly. And, you know, if you reach outside of it, it, you, it feels forced or it, it, like it feels exhausting. Or if you know, if, 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 if it feels exhausting, you, you know, you're off um, or you're trying too hard or you're pushing too hard. And it, like, you just, you know, like when you're on the right, when it's flowing and it's usually when you're just following the script and when you're just, you do as much work as you can at home. And then it all just comes together when you just are with your scene partner, you have to kind of let it go because I think half of who you are as a, as a character is when you meet your scene partner like they will inform who you are as a as a character like you can't exist in your own bubble oh i love that that's like that's like a life lesson i think so (laughs) i know you can't you just can't you can't like harden the boundaries i I mean i think you gotta like exist with who you're who you're with i guess or i hope that's a life lesson maybe that's a real codependent life lesson but (laughs) you are an actress you are a performer and I want to know where that love of performing came from and when did you know that this is what you wanted to be doing it was early I was I grew up in Cleveland you know I grew up outside of Chicago moved to Minnesota and then I landed in Cleveland around four in fact I knew it was I was four because I have a very distinct early memory at my uncle's house looking in the mirror and saying I'm four today like that was one of my earliest memories um but I and I think it was like I I was like in kindergarten I mean I was it was really early like I there was acting classes after school and I started taking classes at the Cleveland Playhouse and I that just became my every single Saturday and I was like my it was like my people it was like where I felt the most at home, I would take $2 and I would get literally a Snickers bar and a regular Pepsi. And that was like my snack on a Saturday, or we would go across the street to Burger King, <laughs> not the healthiest of diets, but I, um, but I just remember it being like the best set. And I just, we just took classes, a bazillion classes. And I was hooked. Like that's all I had ever wanted to do from then on. So that's where it started. And then, then it never stopped. Like I never, ever wanted it to stop. Let me ask you this. We, we live in a time when expertise is not always valued. You are a trained actress. You went to Northwestern, you went to Yale, you really studied your craft. Can you speak to the power of expertise and what has been yes. a very successful career for you? Yes, and this is so interesting that you bring this up because I was able to talk to the beautiful graduating class um, last year at Yale, which is now I think called something else the David Geffen School of Drama. But anyway, they were amazing and terrified because they were, you know, graduating in a pandemic. And I was like, so grateful that they had spent that time learning and spent that time in that space because I think the arts are so imperative and it makes, and it is like, people so want to get famous so fast. And there are those people that really just have it and just decide to act and they are so natural and they are movie stars like right off the bat and amazing actors right off the bat and they have something that I could never possibly have like genetic wise is just like everything wise they're just born to be performers and actors and that I that is just what it is I come from a family of trained musicians, classical musicians, and I know you are as well. And there is something about a, cra- a craft that like anchors me to something ancient and like lit fire in a, in a cave storyteller wise that means, the, means something deep to me that, that, that I hold very important and dear to my heart that that kind of flexibility as a performer is important that I think that that is maybe why I have been able to not be pigeonholed that I feel like there that it isn't just a fluke 
that it is because, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not, but I have to believe somewhere that it is because of my training and that it is somewhere because I've spent that time and that money otherwise. <laughs> but I think I, I do feel like there is something about that training that, that I've been able to have that flexibility as a performer to not be pigeonholed or not let myself be pigeonholed. Um, and I also think because people want something so fast right now and they, they want to get it so fast. Like I have no social media myself and I have no, nothing against it, but I just think there's stars being made every second and burn out every second. And if one wants to have a career in the arts that is deep and lasting, then I, I think training is, is something to consider. Um, you know, I watched a documentary on the New York School of Ballet and I was like, yes, yes. Like why that is like a, that is an art form. And I, I feel like acting belongs to the same. I think there's something to training that gives you more than the, the thing that you're training on. Yes, for sure. That's the staying power. I think, uh, yes, that is a great, again, a great pivot, not to use your word, but like, I think that's a great pivot. Like, I think even in my, our beautiful class at Yale, like, and we had, I mean, God, I love, I mean, we had such a beautiful class of human beings and even, and, and to all the people that found incredible careers that were not in the performing arts, what they learned, like what we all learned about just being still in our bodies or just being in our bodies and, and finding our voice and finding our breath and being, and, and being still with our emotions and letting our emotions pass through whatever that is, is like, that is, that is life. That is something like you talk to, I talk to like lay people, like people that haven't had that kind of training. And it's interesting like it, that we that we have a currency and a language that a lot of people, I think like people that haven't had training or, or like aren't in, that don't have an emotion, that don't have an emotional, like a, a language, an emotional language or background in that kind of training, it's different. It's, it's, it's very different. I wonder who was the biggest influence on you as an artist? I think Gina Rollins. Really? Yeah. The, the actress, Gina Rollins, who, uh, Cassavetti's muse and wife, for sure, I think. How so? Just because I remember having mono and being in high school and my mom rented, like, I think opening night or a woman under the influence. And I just was like, what? Like, it was such a raw nerve, just like open, like nerve on the bone performance that I was just like, what? And she just was like, kind of messy and and wasn't, you know, totally camera ready, but she was so gorgeous in her honesty that I was like, I think that was like a big influence, like performance wise, person wise, like in like that I would relate to. I mean, I was gonna say Evan Yanulis, our teacher, yeah. our acting teacher yeah. at Yale. Profound impact on all of us, I believe. I think so. Yeah, for pra for in terms of practical magic. That was Evan. Yeah. She ran a tough classroom. She did. And she was, she was like not interested in anything that wasn't the truth. And, oh. and she was, she was not interested in, in, yeah. Uh, yeah. She was, she was, um, she was, she was no joke. And she was, um, but she always responded like, when you were when you were in the in the pocket of it she was like right there with you always so i yeah i think she i respected the shit out of her pardon my french but yeah i think that she would be the one okay i have one last question for you um what was the biggest yes you've had to make in your life your career i think probably moving out to la because I really, you know, I love LA. I do love LA. I love so much of it. And I'm like, really, my kids are school. They're out in school here. They've got their family, you know, their friendship families. They're like, you know, they're, they're like dug in deep here. I've got my like friendship network out here, but who do I miss New York? I really do. So 
I feel like that was, that was like the biggest one. Like that was like the pivot in the road for me of like, oh my God. Okay. I'm looking at it. Like, which, which is this? And I mean, I kind of, you know, it was with crossing Jordan and it was like, I could have, you know, just gone back and forth, but then it would just became impractical. I have another question. I'm not letting you off yet. I want to, you know, when I, <laughs> you know how we do, Catherine. You know I do, I do. I want, I want to know, A, when you, when you mentioned coming to. You want to know what love is? I want, I want you to show is. me. I want you to show me. <laughs> okay. I want to feel what love is. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about, and it, it references an earlier question you were talking about, but you moved to LA and your life really changed in a beautiful, beautiful way, I think. Um, and you have this really, what I think unique gift, this unique gift that you have is that I've noticed throughout your career that people work with you over and over and over again, mm -hmm. which is unusual in many ways. Lots of times people wanna run for people after they work together. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I look at your work and your body of work, I see repetition that mm. happens. And I think that's a huge testament to your humanity and your talent. I mean, I think we're very similar in this regard. Like my, my work is also a day of my life. Like those are hours of my life, my like one precious life that I'm living. And so I really try to make those hours as beautiful and like filled as they can be and so I don't want to be bitching around like I want to be I, I want to make connections I want to make it joyful for everybody I want to find that you know work family connection there and so a crew I love a crew like I I am in awe of a crew because they're there before we get there and after we leave and they are the ones who just love making movies more than anything. So mm. I, I think I'm always in, in mad respect of the, the circus feeling of it. Like the, the feeling like, you know, someone's there to pitch the tent and, you know, we're there to, you know, the, I love the feeling of it. So maybe that has something to do with it. I, I just love a good vibe. You know, and, and, and speaking of people you've worked with in the past, Will Ferrell. Yeah. From Anchorman. Um, and now you're going to be doing, which is coming out in what, next week, two weeks? November 12th on the Apple shrink. Plus TV. Yeah. The shrink Apple Next TV Door. Plus. I want to yes. know about The Shrink Next Door because it looks like it's going to be a show. Yeah. It's going to be, we, I just got back from New York. We premiered it there. It's um based on the podcast, a Wondery and Bloomberg podcast. It's, um so it's based on a true story. Um about a, 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 a patient psychiatrist relationship that kind of just becomes um, very like over time, very slowly manipulative. And it's like one of the, it's a really, really great true story. And um, Paul Rudd plays the psychiatrist. Will Farrell plays the patient. I play Will's sister who, and family who's like fiercely protective. And they slowly, the psychiatry slowly drives a wedge between them that lasts like almost 30 years. It's like really intense. And I got to really, I got to spend time with the actual woman who is amazing. Her name is Phyllis. And she is just, was incredibly open about her experience. And um, we text a lot and um, it's a, it's a really deep, uh, deep story. And it was so great to work with Will again in this capacity, because, you know, Anchorman and Step Brothers, like, you know, I had like, a, you know, we, we, we didn't really connect in those ways. And this, we have, have a lot of juicy scenes together. It was really fun. That's so good. Yeah, I can't wait Catherine, for you to see it. I can't, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to be there. <laughs> can't wait. Catherine, thank you so much for your time today. And your oh, I love to you. Come and share your wisdom with us. I am super grateful. Oh, I'm so excited about this podcast. I love you so. So you know I'd be here. First well, stop. Thank you. Thank you. And to those of you who are watching or listening, remember, we all have a voice, so use yours wisely.